go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and take a seat. We're going to run our announcements real quickly. Brother, uh, brother Jerry, teaching opportunities, Sunday school. We have a study in the book of Isaiah and a study on how to walk the walk you talk. Sunday evenings, I'm teaching out of Acts 9 on the marks of an effective personal ministry. Wednesday evenings, Genesis 6, we continue in the study of the invasion of the demons. For OCC, if you want to collect stuff during the year for later on in the year to mail off, summertime, uh, stuff like uh, balls and ropes and stuffed animals, noisemakers, you can buy and send to somebody else. That's always nice. Elders, we meet Tuesday at 6. And then you know what starts tomorrow. 39? 35 pre-registration, so we'll probably have 50 or so kids. One more sleep. One more? One more sleep. No vacation lunch. Okay. One more sleep. Huh? And then on the 2nd of July, we're celebrating Dennis and Casey's wedding by having a fiesta after the a.m. service. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer of things we need. So just go ahead and sign up and bring something and we'll enjoy each other's company. And on the 31st, Friday the th uh, 21st, 31st of July, we're going to have a movie, Priceless. It's a story about uh, human trafficking. And we'll have uh, movie snacks and you can bring movie snacks and we'll have uh, sodas and stuff and uh, we'll just enjoy our time on Friday the 21st at 6 and then Nikki wanted to th thank everybody who sent cards and things to her sister Gloria after her recent surgery and I think that's it that is it here's something for uh, the dads that are here and, uh, Little boy asked his dad, he said, Dad, are bugs good to eat? And the father replied, Son, let's not talk about things like that at the dinner table. After the dinner was over, the father asked his son, What it was it that you wanted to ask me about? The boy replied, Oh, nothing. There was a bug in your soup, but now it's gone. <laughs> All right, let's get ready to worship the Lord. Yes. Amen. Amen. Provide your own soundtrack here for this uh, introduction.
As our Father, our Jehovah Jireh, He provides for us. Such a wonderful Father to us.
Amen. You can be seated. And it's time to send the kids to Children's Church. Curtis, Curtis. You only have one? We only have one. Two. Two. You'll be there in a Rory. Rory goes to nurse. Oh, okay. He's going with you, by the way. been a pretty hectic morning. Yes, sir. Welcome back. Welcome back. It's exactly. good to be back. I want to, uh, I think this is the first time I've missed two Sundays consecutively since we started this ministry in 2011. So, went and saw my grandson graduate, met and uh, went and met my great granddaughter in California. And I want to thank everybody that substituted for me for, uh, Tom and John and Mr. Mike, thank you, each and every one of you, and Roger, amen. So let's see what we're, okay, so uh, when we last spoke together, our subject was, uh, the from the Gospel of John was uh, Jesus displaying his deity. And as we saw the last time I was with you, the Jews, even though Jesus explain, uh, displayed his deity to them numerous times, they would not accept the signs or the miracles that he gave them. The miracles he gave them did not meet their criteria. And in fact, no matter what miracle Christ might have done, nothing he would have done would have met their criteria. And that is evidenced by the fact that even when he was resurrected, they still didn't accept that. They still didn't believe that. So, uh, and then as we closed last time, we looked at the picture of uh, John 2, 23, where Jesus, again, because of the signs he had been doing, there were those, it says, that believed in him. But then it says Jesus did not believe in their belief, okay? And that provided for us a picture of false faith, which was a problem then, and it's still a problem for us even to this day. So today we begin a new section of scripture, which is entitled, Teaching the Teacher. Teaching the Teacher. So I want to start this morning by reminding you that preaching is really not a spectator sport. It's not a matter of just sitting and watching it's definitely not a matter, it's not a form of spiritual entertainment. Preaching is really a system of engagement. It's a conversation, if you will, okay? I've always believed that you get from the teaching what you bring to the teaching. And one of the things that the way we teach here is expository teaching, word by word, verse by verse, is that... Uh, it directly connects you to the scripture. It engages you beyond me with the word of God. And that's the intention. The intention is that you understand that when you come here, I'm just merely a tool. I'm not anybody special. I'm just somebody trying to explain the word of God. I'm just a mirror reflecting a light to point you towards the true light, the word of God. All right? So your benefit from preaching is going to be in direct proportion to your thoughtful engagement with the text, with the scripture of the Lord. I'm saying this particularly this morning because, about, because of the things that we're about to start studying in this new section of scripture. We're going to begin to speak about one of the most important sections in all of scripture. In all of the 66 books of the Bible, I, I, you might argue that this might be one of the three or four most important areas in the scripture. First of all, because it is Jesus' words, he speaks these words, and there's numerous places throughout the New Testament where Jesus speaks. And really, when you think of it, the whole Bible is the word God speaking to us through his word. It's all divinely inspired. But what we have here is something 
that is very important in its content. It has to do with the issue of regeneration of a new birth, which is really the first great miracle that takes place in the salvation of a sinner. Now, we understand the doctrine of salvation is made up of many, many different elements. Uh, there is sovereign election, there's predestination, there's the reality of regeneration, there's the truth of conversion, there's the great truth which we, we love, that of justification, there's the element of sanctification as we walk our walk, there's the truth of redemption, there are elements of faith and repentance in salvation, and all of these are aspects and components of the one big, great big miracle of salvation. But when we come into John chapter 3, we come to the first great truth here of regeneration. In the work of God to save his people, this is the second work. The first work was election. God, before the beginning of time, chose his people, before the foundation of the world, chose his people, those that he predestined to be saved. And then, uh, so we have the election, and then that election then, one day, somehow, somewhere, is then activated into salvation, okay? And that's the conversation that we're going to see that Jesus has today with Nicodemus. Very foundational in our understanding of the work of God in saving his people. So the overarching text for the, for the next, for the foreseeable future, I'm not sure how long it'll take me to teach this, because it is very rich, is from John 3, 1 through 10. John 3, 1 through 10. If you were ready for the word of God, would you signify that by saying amen? And would you stand with me out of respect to the reading, which is the word of God, a light into our feet. John writes for us that there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The, blend, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, You are the teacher of Israel, and you do not know these things. Thank you. You can be seated. Five times in those ten verses, Jesus speaks of being born again or being born. And that idea of being born is a very familiar concept to believers. We're familiar with those words. You may have asked somebody, are you a born again believer? It has been popular for a long time to say of oneself as being, yes, I am, in your outline, the words are born again. I'm a born again Christian. And originally that phrase came about so as to disassociate Christians from traditional Christianity. Did you know that? That's how that phrase began. I'm a born again Christian. All right? And, the, the, and it still is to some degree today, but not the way it, it, it was at once time. 
the idea, it's almost become a, a, a catchphrase, a, an adjective phrase, born again Christian. And for, for decades, literally, evangelists have been calling people to be born again. Uh, they've told people that they need to be born again. They've told, them, they've told them how to be, were you ever told how to be born again? Yeah, I was told how to be born again. The steps you have to take, the path you have to follow, the prayer you have to pray in order to be born again. There have literally been thousands of books written on being born again. There have been many, 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 many articles innumerable tracks. We have a bunch in the office. If you, if you want to read one, we, can, we have a track on how to be born again. But the very idea of being born again is completely alien to anything that a sinner could do. Let me say that again. The very idea of being born again is completely alien to anything that a sinner, in fact, could do. And that's why Jesus chose those words. He used that analogy of being born again very purposefully. And the whole point of the analogy of being born again is to demonstrate that Jesus is saying that something has to happen to you today that you can't do yourself. Think of it. Think of it. You can't contribute to this being born again in any way. The analogy describes a spiritual reality. The one born again makes no contribution to the birth. Think of a physical birth. What did you contribute to your physical birth? And that's the way, that's why the Lord chooses this analogy because we made no contribution to our physical birth and here he says, again, you can make no contribution to your spiritual birth. None. After all, Jesus, a great mind, the greatest mind that ever lived, a great linguist, could have used any analogy he wanted to, but he chose this specific analogy. He intended to communicate that this is something to which you and I contribute nothing, okay? He wanted it to be crystal clear in our minds that when this new birth happens, we in no way contribute to it. Well, you might say, well, I have to believe. Yes, but who gives you the belief to believe? It is, in fact, the power of God that gives you the belief to believe. It's just like physical birth. What did you do? Did you knock on the door and ask, can I come out? No. You were born. You were born. That's exactly the analogy here. No one gives him or herself to physical birth, and no one by any means give him, gives himself or herself to spiritual life. And you outline the words are spiritual life. And that's the point. Spiritual birth or regeneration or new creation or whatever you want to use, whatever phrase you want to use, is the second work of God in salvation. And it is wholly and completely of God. You don't get to take one little claim in regards to it. The first work, election. The second work is this regeneration, being bo born again, and both are completely holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, a work of God. Okay? Are we good on that? Any questions? Comments? All right. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is an important foundational text for us. And this is so basic that unless a person in some way, shape, or form understands this idea of regeneration, of a new birth, then they really will have great difficulty understanding salvation. You don't, you, know, you don't have to understand the doctrine of election to be saved. But let me tell you, and there's a lot of people in our churches that don't understand what it means to be born again, and that's why they're not born again, and that's why our churches are in the situation that they're in. This is foundational 
to who you are in Jesus Christ. This is what makes church, church. This is the reality of what the church used to be and the fallacy of what the church has been become, as evidenced in John 2, 23, and we'll speak about that again in a moment. But you have to have an understanding of this divine doctrine of regeneration and new birth. You may not know it by that name. You might be in deepest, darkest Africa and ne never heard the name Jesus, but you still, to be saved, have to understand that it's something that is not of you, that it is all of him. All right? So, it's essential not only for salvation, it's also essential for things that we do as a church body, such as VBS, which begins tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. If you know any little kids, bring them. We'll take everybody we can get. We've got more than enough material. But it's important when we explain what it means to be a child of God that we have a proper explanation. And Jesus Christ in John 3 is going to explain exactly what it means to be saved as he speaks to this man named Nicodemus. Okay? This is a crucial truth. And consequently, we're going to work through it. And I want you to commit yourself with me to engage yourself in this amazing conversation which leads to an understanding of this amazing revelation of being born again. How many of you know the story of Nicodemus? Everybody, just about. Very, very familiar story. We know his name. His name, by the way, is a Greek name. It's transliterated from, uh, from Greek to Aramaic. Uh, Nick comes from the word. What's the swoosh? Nike. What's Nike mean in Greek? Victory. And then Vimas is from the Greek, uh, transliterated over from the Greek, and it means uh, people. So the name Nicodemus means victory over the people. His parents named him that. It's a, not an unusual name, uh, but it's a, it's a strong name if you think about it. You give your kid a name, uh, victory over the people. People, I was, talk, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they told me, I said, well, what, what's, that, what's that person's child's name? And they told me this name, and I've never heard of it before. And they said, well, it came from the Bible. Oh, man. Sometimes we, we look for very unusual names for our children. This isn't an unusual name. It's a strong name. His parents gave him that name. They felt that he would be a strong man, totally Jewish, but uh, a, a Greek name that they brought over into the Aramaic. But what's most important here is for you and I to understand the theology that comes out of this amazing account as Jesus speaks to Nicodemus. So we're going to break this 10 verses. I'm going to break it into three sections for us. The one we just read, we're going to look at it. The first section in verses 1 and 2 are the sinner's worry. Then we're going to go to the second section, which is the Savior's way. And then we're going to look at the final section, the Spirit's work, okay? Simple little outline, easy to remember. Sinner's worry, Savior's way, Spirit's work. And this account now is, is much more than a story. Uh, many times this is told as a story. It's taught in Sunday school. But many times it's not delved into very deeply, and we're going to do that here. We're going to look at it in great t detail. And as you have become accustomed, uh, it will take me a while to get through this section of Scripture. Nothing new. But I promise you, that what is here is really a nugget of gold. This is a treasure that, we'll, uh, that we will highly prize as we grow cl closer and closer to these truths here. Now, I've told you before, and I'll tell you again, and I've told you that I will tell you again, that the purpose of the Gospel of John can be understood in two pace, basic concepts. Number one, it's, it, it is polemical. And I use that word polemical because it's the best word, not to impress you with a fancy word. And polemical simply means that it is, it is something that is strongly debated. It's a critical item. 
John teaches polemically that he, he teaches to defend the deity of Jesus Christ. He repetitively, we will see over and over and already have, speak to the evidence of Jesus as God. Every paragraph, every section, every incident that he uses indicates to us that Jesus is in fact the Son of God. So he has this polemical, if you will, aspect to his writing. Secondly, there is the evangelistic aspect to his writing. If he can get you to believe that Jesus Christ is in fact the Son of God, if he can get you to understand that and believe in Jesus and then you can have eternal life in Christ, okay? That's the evangelistic side. And this account that we begin to look at today is no different than any of the other accounts in the Gospel of John. First, it's polemical. First, it proves that Jesus is God. And how does it prove that Jesus is God? Because Jesus knows Nicodemus without ever having met Nicodemus. And what does that mean? That Jesus is, in fact, omniscient, that he knows everything. He's never met the man, and yet he knows the man, okay? And then, with that proof having been provided that he knows everything about everybody, then we will see the evangelistic uh, side of the coin as Jesus will teach the necessary truth of salvation to this man named Nicodemus. So Jesus... John is consistent in his writing, always teaching the same way, and what a blessing it is for us that he wrote that way. So what, makes, what this story makes for us, listen, what this story makes very clear to us today, and I'm going to tell you this today, and I'm going to tell you this at the end of this section, and in the middle, I'm going to show you this, but what this story tells us today, what it makes very clear to us is that salvation is not for those who want to become more religious. And your outline, the word is religious. Salvation is not for those who want to become more religious. Salvation is not for those who try harder to be good people. Okay? Salvation is not for those who live morally improved lives or who turn away from certain vices or who escalate their noble and good behavior. Salvation is not for any of those people. The kingdom of salvation, the kingdom of God, opens its doors only to people who abandon all that they are. Did you get that? You have to be willing to abandon all that you are. The doors of the kingdom only open to those who abandon all their self-effort. How does God see your works if you don't know him? They are but filthy rags. So your self-effort is totally useless unless you are, in fact, born again. The doors of the kingdom only open to those who cease to try to earn a place in the kingdom. And it, those doors only open up to those who are given a place in the kingdom. You can't do anything to get it. You have to... Let God give it to you. He is totally responsible. You have to take your life and say, reset. I'm starting all over, and you begin all over again, and you begin a new life as a new creation in Christ. So as we approach this text, I've already mentioned it. I want to take us back to, verse, to 20, uh, chapter 2, verse 23. If you have your Bibles open, 2.23. And this is where we get the, the starting point. This is really the starting point for this story. All right? Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's come to the first Passover of his ministry. The last Passover of his ministry will be when he's crucified. He goes to Jerusalem. He's there with all the other pilgrims who have come 
because of the Passover, in the fe which is followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So there's a couple weeks time frame here that's being spoken of. And in verse 23, during this time, it says, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, many believed in its name, it says. Many believed in its name. They were observing his signs, his miracles, the things he was doing. We know he was doing many of them, John tells us. The whole time he was there, he was doing miracles. He was demonstrating his divine power. And we know that, you know, miracles come in several categories. Power over demons, power over disease, power over death, power over nature. We know, uh, we don't know specifically what he was doing here because John doesn't tell us. But he does tell us he was doing many divine miracles. And as a result of doing those many divine miracles, it says, many believed in his name. Okay? That's what it says. Sounds great, doesn't it? They believed in his name. It's a good starting point. Uh, it's, it's a place where you have to begin. They have to believe, to start with, in, in Jesus. You have to believe in his name, meaning his identity, who he claims to be. There's many who believed in his name. But what does Jesus say? In, what does it say in verse 24? He does not commit himself to, to them. And I told you when I taught that verse that that word commit is the same word that's used for the word believing. He does not believe in their belief. He does not believe in their belief. Okay? Evidently, their believing was not enough. He didn't have faith in their faith. He didn't entrust himself. Some words, versions will use the word entrust himself to them as a savior because they did not believe sufficiently yet to be saved, or he would have. They believed, but they didn't believe enough to be saved. And why didn't he entrust himself to them? How did he do it? What does the end of 24 say? Why? Why did he not believe in their belief? Because in the end of verse 24 it says, because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man. You didn't need to tell him anything about anybody, for he knew what was in the man. He knew. He knew who they were. He knew how they were. You ain't hiding anything from God. Are you trying to hide anything from God? You taking things to your closet to sin? Do you think that God doesn't know what you're doing when you're doing it? God knows everything. Why waste your time hiding it? But... What, 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 what is being said here is that over these period of days, not many days, a couple weeks, Jesus is teaching. He's doing miracles, and people are coming to say to him and saying, I believe in you, Jesus. We believe you're from God. We believe you're a teacher from God. You, you, you do these things that you can't do the things you do unless you have the power of God behind you. But as we see, what Jesus is saying, he's not affirming that faith. He does not establish a relationship with him. Listen, salvation is a personal relationship with God. It's not a thing you do. It's something you experience. And the reason why he doesn't establish a relationship with them is because he knows that they don't have sufficient faith to save. These are people, later on in this, in this big Gospel of John, these are people later that will turn on Christ. God knew who they were because he's omniscient. And we talked about that before. So this omniscience is nothing more than more evidence of him being God. Well, one of these people, I believe that really they could have started chapter 3 with John 2, 23, because I believe one of these people that believed in Jesus but didn't really have enough belief is a man named Nicodemus. I believe Nicodemus is one of these people, and when you read his words, I think you see that. He's, he's the only one we know of, of those people, because he's the only one that Scripture tells us of in this particular incident. And the story, but I believe the story of Nicodemus is there to illustrate to us what is taught previously in 2, 23 and 24. God's word is perfect in its perfection, how it illustrates itself to us so we can understand it easier because we need help. I know I do. 
So Nicodemus is, is one of the many people, I believe, who believed but didn't believe sufficiently to be saved. And how did Jesus know that? Well, Jesus knew who what was inside of Nicodemus, just as he knew about these other pe people. He knew his heart. And here's an illustration of that in these opening verses. It's a very, very powerful account on many levels and from many different perspectives. But let's just start with the beginning. John 3, 1. And let's start with a man named Nicodemus. And we'll begin with the section that we've called the sinner's worry. The sinner's worry. I want you to consider as we begin to study this small section, why did Nicodemus come? Now, as you can see from verse 1, this man named Nicodemus, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This is a highly esteemed individual. He's a formidable man in the religious system of the nation Israel. He, it, it, in fact, it seems that he actually stood head and shoulders above others because in verse 10, Jesus says, you are the teacher. He calls him the teacher. In the Greek, that's written in definite article. You are the teacher. You are the preeminent teacher. This means this man had reached the pinnacle of Judaism because he is the teacher. He's the teacher that the teachers go to. He's a very religious and devout man. But for some reason, he has sought out Jesus. He's come to him at night, and he's worried. I believe he's worried. I think he's a little bit fearful. That's my granddaughter speaking out. He's anxious. I think he might be doubtful of the, what he's been believing. I think he, his life lacks assurance. Listen, if you're a child of God, you should lack nothing in assurance. You should be anxious for nothing. You should be guilty in nothing. Now, I understand there's times where all, we all have our weaknesses. But generally speaking, we shouldn't be in Nicodemus' shoes. But Nicodemus is in these shoes because he's an apostate. He's part of a defective religious system. I believe he knows the truth. He has turned his back on the truth. He's a, for lack of a better word, a hypocrite. He doesn't know God. He doesn't truly love God. His heart hasn't been changed by God. He's just another hypocrite. And Jesus, who knows his heart, knows all about him. He knows the heart of a hypocrite. He knows that a hypocrite is full of fear and full of doubt and dread. And what does he fear? Well, he fears, what is the sinner's worry? Well, he fears that he's not headed for heaven. He fears he's not headed for the resurrection. He fears that he will not have eternal life in heaven. And that, beloved, is a very, very difficult place to find yourself. A very, very difficult place to find yourself. Okay? All right. Well, today we've looked at the benefits of preaching for the listener. It is appropriate or proportionate to their, what they put into it. We've spoke, spoken here of the, uh, the great miracle of salvation, of... Uh, being born again. We've, uh, looking at this scripture that's before us to understand the basics of salvation. Uh, we've described salvation as, a, as not being a self-help program. All right? And we've looked at Nicodemus, who was worried because he knew his heart's condition. My question for you today is, are you worried? Do you really know this man named Jesus? The one who came and sacrificed himself for you before you were even born. The one who loved you enough 
to hang on a cross and suffer cruelly as the Son of God. The one who wants to take the burdens which will oppress your life and remove them. The one that can give you the true attitude that it's going to be okay each and every day. Are you worried today? Our praise and worship team is going to come up. We're going to sing a song of invitation. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And as we sing that song, if you need to, to come and speak to me about this Jesus that I've spoken of, you're more than welcome to come up. If you just need to pray at the altar to kneel before God, you can kneel in your chair. If you want to come up and share a praise with the congregation, whatever the need might be today, this is your time and the Spirit's time. It's not my time. I'm just a mouthpiece. I recognize that. So uh, if you would uh, join me, stand with me, and join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for your word, Lord, the truth which is your word. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to examine your word and to seek out your truths for us. We thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you have a special plan for our lives. All we need to do, Lord, is to tap into that plan. And by, you know, all we've got to do to do that, Lord, is say yes. We need to be willing to stop so we can go. We need to be willing to quit so we can get started. We need to give up who we are so we can be who you want us to be. So, Father, we give this time to you, Lord. Whatever the need might be today, whatever the circumstance of life might be today, Lord, we, we rest in you, knowing that you have the answer, you have the way for us to walk. All we need to do is to call on you. Father, we pray these things in the magnificent name of Jesus. Amen. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King.
If you just sit down, just give us a minute. The, uh, some of the guys are going to hand out some uh, gifts for the fathers that are here. Go ahead and play a little bit of that for us, guys. If we get sound, no sound, we can hum it. I don't know the words, so we can hum it. All right. The guys are going to be, uh, go ahead guys, hand those gifts out to everybody, to the men that is. All right. Okay, we're going to forget the video. We've had that, we've had that problem today. Bear with us. We'll, we'll figure out what we're doing. Go ahead and hand those out to all the fathers that are here. There were four men in the hospital waiting room because their wives were having babies. And a nurse went up to the first man and said, congratulations, you're the father of twins. And he said, well, that's amazing. I work for the Minnesota twins. <laughs> the nurse came up to the second guy and said, congratulations, you're the father of triplets. He said, well, that's kind of weird. I work for the 3M company. The nurse came up to the third man and said, congratulations, you're the father of quintuplets. I can't believe it, he said. I work for the Four Seasons Hotel. <laughs> the last man was moaning and groaning and banging his head against the wall. The nurse asked him, what's wrong? He said, I work for 7-Up. <laughs> all right. I, all right, I think I'm done. It was a joy to be with you here today, and I hope you'll come back to see us again. May God bless your week, and uh, we do have a, before Brother Mike comes up and we have a closing song, Brother Mike's going to lead us in our closing prayer. We have two birthdays this week. Mr. Xander is going to be, what, 21? How old is Xander going to be? 14. He's a real teenager. And Marcia, did Marcia run away? She's in nursery, and today's Marsha's birthday. Say Mar happy birthday to Marsha on the way out. Let's sing to Mr. Xander. Happy birthday to Xander. Happy birthday to Xander. Happy birthday, Mr. Xander. Happy birthday to you. All right, let's stand. Brother Michael, pray, and then the praise and worship team will close us up. Thank you. So many things, Lord, that all we can say is thank you. 
what you've done for us. You created us. You allow us to exist. Help us to realize, Lord, the, the magnitude of your greatness. The lessons, the lessons that are made known to us through your scripture. Help us, Lord, to interpret as you would have it done and share it. Share the gospel to our friends and our neighbors. As we leave, be with us, Lord, and let this message stay with our hearts. And when the opportunity presents itself, give us the discernment and the wisdom to spring forth with the gospel to those that we claim to care for. Heavenly Father, we are yours. We are believers in Jesus Christ, and we praise your holy name. Again, Lord, it's only in your name we will pray. Amen. Amen.